Welcome to Blending the Family, the podcast. Topics can range from dads hitting rock bottom, daughters watching their parents divorce, or even what is a good wine for couples to have while talking about finances. Here's your host, whose Facebook likes are actually a negative number, Tommy Maloney. Welcome to another edition of Blending the Family. I'm your host, Tommy Maloney, host of this podcast, and excited for you to be here. On this episode, we have Mel Schwartz. He's a practicing psychotherapist, marriage counselor, writer, speaker. His latest, newest book comes out on September 1st. Hint, hint. The Possibility Principle, How Quantum Physics Can Improve the Way You Think, Live, and Love. And on this episode, we talk about things such as Sir Isaac Newton, how to help your kids get through, well, making decisions. And I tried. I tried to get Mel to analyze me, but hey, didn't want to do it. I I, I gave it to him. I gave him. It was an open book. Didn't want to do it. That's really about it. I just want to uh, do the introduction. Again, Mel Schwartz, author of the book, The Possibility Principle, How Quantum Physics Can Improve the Way You Think, Live, and Love. Yeah, I really don't have a lot because I'm excited about this interview. I was kind of nervous at first because quantum physics, man, I have enough problems trying to walk and have a conversation in my head, let alone have to interview somebody as smart as Mel Schwartz is and talk about Mel or uh, quantum physics or Isaac Newton. Anyway, hope you enjoy this episode. If you need me, you can always find me at the website, blendingofthefamily.com, or just shoot me an email, tommy at blendingofthefamily.com. Don't forget, we always have some great books. The Kids Book, 10 Tips on How to Survive Your Parents' Divorce, and my book also on the website, 25 Tips on How, 25 Tips uh, for Divorce Dads. Oh my gosh. I don't know if I need a nap, coffee, or an adult beverage. I vote adult beverage. Enjoy! I'm going to warn you, Mel, I am an open book, and feel free to analyze me any time during this interview. I, I don't analyze. Oh. That's, that's not the way I see. How I've, do you see? I've trained myself to try to see in wholeness. You know, analyzing is when we slice and dissect things, we, like looking through a microscope. And I, I believe that creates false constructed realities for us. I try to get the gestalt, the big picture. <laughs> I like that word. That's a great word, gestalt. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me ask you, um, the possibility principle, mm-hmm. what was the aha moment for writing this book? And I know in the in the, in the introduction you talk about your bike ride. Yes. You talk about coming back to your office and just randomly. And I don't want to say randomly because, you know, throughout the book, you talk about the universe. And I really don't believe it was a, a, a it was a random choosing. Quite possibly the universe was choosing that book for you to kind of work on what you were going through at the time. Well, quite right. I, I, I agree with that, Tommy. It's, it's actually the way I see reality. There's no distinction between the universe and me. You know, like when people say the universe provides, the universe gives you clues, we're removing ourselves from that universe. So if I see myself as an intrinsic part of the universe, it just means to me I'm getting out of my own way in which there are patterns unfolding, pathways opening to us. And if we learn to get out of our own way and see and operate without fear, these great things happen. You know, Carl Jung may have called it synchronicity, mm-hmm. um, which, are, which has become a guide. Tell me, about that. tell me about that, that bike ride or tell so, us about so your bike ride. I had recently divorced, had two young sons at the time. My sons were young. And they were with their mother on that particular weekend. Uh, They actually lived primarily with me. And so in not having them with me that weekend, I was feeling lonely, out of sorts. 
beautiful spring day, so I went for a bike ride. And alarmingly, I felt the start of an anxiety attack. And I turned the bike around and headed back home. I had no idea what relief that would give me. I went into the house, and I thought I absentmindedly picked up a book on the shelf that I had never read. The book was called The Turning Point by Fritjof Capra, quantum physicist. And I started to read about what he called a paradigm shift, a new way of seeing reality and how it was operating, which came to us through quantum physics. Now, I'm not a scientist. I wouldn't understand real science or the formulas or the math. Simple principles. Basically, he was sharing that the universe, reality, is inseparable. Everything is part of everything else, kind of like Eastern religions have taught us. But now it was coming to us through science. And that it was full of uncertainty. And rather than the uncertainty being a problem, uncertainty equals new potential. Within a few pages of reading, I noticed that my anxiety had retreated. So I was really curious. Why? And I started to read more and more and more about this new worldview that was emerging. And it just absolutely altered my life and headed me in an entirely new direction. And prior to this, Mel, had you ever had an anxiety attack? No, it was the first time I've been anxious. But <laughs> this, this felt different, which was my heart was pounding out of my chest. Every moment felt like it was an eternity and it wouldn't end. So this was really very different. So my consideration became, if this helped me overcome that anxiety attack, and so much more than simply that, then why couldn't I use that technique and that approach with other people as a therapist? So I began to integrate my new learning into who I was, how I think, how I live, and how I would practice as a therapist. It permitted me to develop an entirely new approach to therapy. Many years ago, people asked me what I called that process, and I called it emergent thinking, kind of thinking where we don't reduce things to smaller and smaller parts, but we actually we alter our thinking so we become an integral part of the universe. We get in the flow of life. And uh, that is what culminated in this new book, The Possibility Principle. I'm, I'm curious because you said you're not a scientist. How did, I mean, how, was there an interest at one point of, of science? And is that how this book, you know, ended up on your bookshelf? No, um, I was a, probably a poor student in science, frankly, in school never took science as an elective. For me, reading about what quantum physics was revealing was perhaps more about philosophy, okay. a, new, a new philosophy for a living, a new game plan of life. So as I read about it, Tommy, I learned that the way we think reality operates came to us basically from Sir Isaac Newton, 17th century thinker. He gave us what's known as determinism which is that if we have enough information and enough data, we can predict the future. Now, as a therapist, I've come to see what happens to people when they become addicted to certainty. People start to mull over, if I do this and make this decision, what will the consequences be? And they become rooted in fear. The more wed we are to certainty and predictability, the more that equals fearful thought and anxiety. Now, quantum physics teaches us that reality is thoroughly uncertain. Typically, we avoid uncertainty. We even think of the word uncertain in a negative way, ironically. But I came to see that uncertain equals possibility. If things aren't known, all things are possible. So in our lives, we kind of live dulled, robotic lives, but we seek uncertainty by watching sports, going to movies, some people gamble. Oscar Wilde said, uncertainty is the essence of romance, which is true if you think about it. But what happens once we secure a relationship and it becomes predictable? The romance fades away. We start to complete each other's sentences. 
We think we know what the other is saying. Everything collapses into the certain. And it's a death knell for romance and relationship. In this book, I teach a whole new way of communication based upon uncertainty, which makes us present and alive and helps us validate each other. Well, I, I, I think you bring up a great point because in the book you talk about an example of using the movie Groundhog Day. Yes. And it to me it sounds like what you're talking about is that because of uncertainty, we fall into that Groundhog Day. We're just doing the same thing over and over and over again and just not really working on either our relationships or ourselves. Is that, does that sound right? Al? Absolutely so. And we come to a belief, Tommy, that belief is it's hard to change. Now, it isn't hard to change, but the belief that it is becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So going back to Newton, he taught us that reality, that the world is like a giant machine. And we are cogs in that machine, separate and disconnected from one another. Now, that gives us any lack. It gives us a lack of meaning and purpose. There's no connectivity. And out of that worldview, it is hard to change because an object at rest stays at rest. It requires force. Exactly. But here's what I've come to say. In the nanosecond, before I have my next thought. I'm in a state of pure potential. But if I keep having the same old thoughts, I don't change. So I've developed an approach, which I share at length in this book, about how we can learn to actually think, breaking free of old thought and old beliefs. And that's where change occurs. Um, I'm going to see if this, this question will, will... You talk about overcompensation. Mm -hmm. And as I was researching your book, one of the things that popped in my head is, as far as overcompensating was I'm an only child, Mel. And one of the things that I, I struggle with is when my two bonus daughters have conflict and, you know, they're just, they're just you know, sisters, love, all that. But for me, I have to run away and hide because the way I look at it, Mel, is my overcompensating in that situation is because I don't like the conflict that's going on. Therefore, I have to escape. Yes. Does that make sense? Well, it does. So let me try to tease that out with you and see if we can illuminate that. So what you're describing is that you are a conflict avoidant. Very right? much so. Very much so. Now, were you that way before you were a father? Well, again, it comes from, you know, being an only child where my mom worked, you know, my mom worked two jobs. So, I mean, I, I'd spent a lot, I mean, a lot of time. Uh, with myself. And and here here's something I always found really funny is that when I got into corporate training and I took the Myers-Briggs test and the Myers-Briggs test came back that I was a, an I, a, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, that I like to be alone, essentially. Yes. And that was a huge eye opener for me because my boss at the time, she asked me, said, when you go home from work, do you like to be around people or do you want to just, you know, kind of decompress and be alone? I said, I, I like being alone. And I found that very interesting because, again, the career I was in as a corporate trainer, essentially I was partially an entertainer as well. But once I came off the stage, so to speak, yeah, I would revert back to, you know, somewhat hiding in my cubicle. So, yes, I've always had that, I guess, ability, Mel, to hide as best I can from conflict. So you actually chose a career, perhaps, which would allow you to come out of the introversion of being alone and to engage others. What I, what I describe in my book in regard to compensation, let me, I'll, I'll describe it for you. For example, 
Suppose in your childhood, you grew up in a highly conflicted home, or you had um, an alcoholic parent. There was a lot of chaos. Um, you may have developed a personality whereby you'd become a people pleaser. That was a coping mechanism you would develop in that childhood because you wanted to feel safe. And it's a sensible adaptation early in life. But now it may be three or four decades later and you're stuck being a people pleaser, which gets in your way of being authentic or genuine or being able to engage confrontation. And so what happens is that oh, as the decades go by and we grow older, we find that those initial coping mechanisms, which were compensations, which may have suited us in childhood, start to burden us. They become like a suit of armor that we're clanking around with. We need to learn to shed these pieces of ourselves, which we no longer need, to allow us to become more authentic and to build more genuine self-esteem. Now, in your circumstance, the fact that you grew up as an only child may have led you to not having sibling rivalries and being able to resolve issues. Um, you know, I, did you experience conflict um, with your parents? Yeah, my parents were divorced. They divorced when I was five. Okay. So therefore, it may be safe to say that you didn't experience on a close personal level confrontation. Therefore... You were uncomfortable with it. You didn't mm -hmm. have the, you didn't develop the skill set to confront. To confront doesn't mean to be aggressive. It simply means to be assertive. We need to assert for ourselves without being aggressive. And you didn't have those opportunities as a child, which may have then led you to be introverted or more comfortable on your own. That sounds about right. <laughs> okay. Um, your book because I found it really interesting uh, here it is all right many books and teachings about personal growth address our thinking and perhaps our beliefs yet they leave out something critically important in appreciation of how our operating workflow informs our beliefs in our thinking in our lives my question is, before discovering the book that essentially is changing your life and created your book, were you heavily into personal development books before, I, before this? I'll, I'll, I'll share a, a brief history of Mel, which may help clarify all this. Um, I was a very average student, um, and after college, um, I went into business. And as a young man, I was rather successful in business. And I built quite a lifestyle for myself, great house, kind of living the life, so to speak. And then I had an epiphany one day, Tommy. I thought to myself, there's got to be more to life than just this. I had figured out a business, knew how to make money, but I was wanting for something else. And I went home that day and said to my wife, who became my former wife, that I was thinking of closing the business. And she was rather alarmed. She said, what, do you, what are you thinking of doing? I said, I'm not sure. I went to sleep that night really excited. Now, I was 40 years old at the time. Excited like a kid before their birthday party, like all things were possible. And so I go to sleep, and I remembered that many years before, someone had asked me, what do you love to do? And my response to them was, I love to help people think differently, look at things differently, get insights. So I wondered to myself, what could that look like for a new career? And by the morning, I had it. I thought I'd go to graduate school, become a psychotherapist, teach, offer seminars, workshops, write books. And I headed down that path. My philosophy, the way I was raised, was, you know, some people say why I can't, whatever it may be. And my philosophy always was, why can't I? So here I am at 40, 
change in careers, which was going to, at least for a time being, indicate a real decrease in income. Two little kids who I ended up raising on my own post-divorce and starting a therapy practice. So my belief was, why can't I? Um, that belief allows me to summon possibility into my life. And perhaps it was that moment that really started me on the path toward this book. So as the years go on and I'm practicing therapy, I develop this new approach, this new way of working with people. I don't believe in objectivity. I don't diagnose my clients. <laughs> I get in their shoes and help them become the people they want and live the lives they want. And so I thought to myself, boy, wouldn't it be great to write a book about this? And then writing the book took many years. And then finding an agent and finding a publisher was challenging. And then on my wish list always was, I'd love to give a TED Talk. And everyone would say, wow, that would be great, but it's so difficult. How are you going to do that? In November of this year, I'm giving a TEDx talk at the Kennedy Library in Boston on the book. When you believe it can happen and you get out of the way of fear and old beliefs and old thoughts that constrain you, all things are possible. And, and But where did this ingrain I can come from? That is a question I can't fully answer yet, honestly, for this reason. I could attribute it to my parents, who kind of gave me that philosophy of you can do anything you want. Yet my younger brother, who grew up in the same home, um, didn't ha end up with that philosophy. He follows a different path in life, which is more predictable and conservative. Perhaps as part of my soul and my soul's experience, Tommy, that somewhere deep, deep within me at the core, more fundamental than the personality, is that my soul believes that I can be and experience all things. It's just a deep conviction. Well, you talk about in your book about fear. Mm -hmm. what, what advice, I, and I really am struggling to say the word advice, but what what offer can you give to people about fear? Because, you know, going back to your story, here you are, like you said, you had a successful business. And one day you said, you know, I want to do something else. And it sounds like what's ingrained in you, Mel, is more of a, a servitude. And that's what you wanted out of your life. And you, you essentially face the fear of the unknown, what, how can others get out of, like, uh, like you eloquently said, how can they get out of their own way? How can they face fear? The you know, fear of the unknown haunts so many people. But what they should be afraid of is fear of the known. Because in so many lives, we are feeling that we're living mediocre or hapless lives. Some people are mired in horrible relationships. We should have a fear of the known, and we should embrace the unknown. Because, again, the, the unknown is where the new possibilities lie. Here's a metaphor that I share with people on occasion. If you have a fear of making a mistake, if you have the fear of the unknown, the exercise I take you through is this. Picture we're standing by the bank of a river, and I say to you, that river the current of the river represents the flow of life. And let's walk into that river and let's get into the flow of life. Think about it, but you do. That flow of life represents change. And as we get into the middle of the river, the current picks up. It's, it's fast. And you grab a hold of a boulder. And they say, what are you doing? And you say to me, well, the river bends up ahead and I don't know where it's going to go. And I need to know where it's going to go. And they said, you know, you see, that's exactly the problem. We have to get into the current and the flow of life, and we're free to navigate as we go along. But the fear is what keeps you holding on to that boulder, so you're not engaging in life. So more, more specific to your question about me, well, I knew that my greater gratification and potential was not being fulfilled in the business I was in. But I don't pay much homage to the notion of mistakes. 
A mistake is a snapshot of a moment in time. It was not a mistake that I had married my former wife, as ill-suited as we were for each other. We both needed to learn and experience what we did and grow to become who we are. It's a different, different worldview, whereby, yes, it's a mistake to get drunk and go out driving my car. But closing my business and going to grad school couldn't have been a mistake. This career might not have developed for me, but something else would have. That's what I call an emergent way of thinking, mm -hmm. where I'm not reducing myself to causality. If I do this, could it be a mistake? To me, we focus as a culture on the fear of our, the consequences of our decisions. If I do this, will it be a mistake? We don't pay attention to the consequences of our inaction. What will happen if I don't do this? See, that's living life in a very circumscribed way. Well, and you bring up a great point, too. And so something I wrote down as far as, far as a question, Mel, um, right. as parents, we want our kids to you know, make positive choices. How can parents help their kids as they grow older not to be scared of making decisions such as, you know, you know, in high school and college when, when kids are choosing their classes or maybe they have to choose, for example, a musical instrument in school or jobs. So how can we parents help our kids learn that it's okay to make decisions, be it right or wrong? I have uh, been teaching a workshop called Raising Resilient Children. Now, resilient doesn't mean you won't fall down, but it means you can bounce back up. I think as parents, an error that we make is that we only share the good about our lives with our children. As parents, if we could share the fuller tapestry of our life experiences, and when we struggled, and when we suffered, and when we had fear, and what we did about it, and hopefully how we overcame it, that would mitigate our children's fear. Because you see, when we don't share that fuller tapestry, when our kids, predictably, are going to go through hard patches, they don't have a reference point that their parents did and came through it okay. They're left with, my parents never had anxiety attacks or fear or this or that. If we don't share it with them, how would they know? So I think that the best thing you can do, Tommy, in, uh, to answer that question is talk about some of your own struggles around making decisions, um, the benefits of making them, and the limitations of not making them. Humanize the experience, and then, then you can end up giving them the life philosophy that we shouldn't fear or get apprehensive or anxious, particularly around small decisions. Try this instrument. If it's not the right one for you, next year you can try a different one. But if we get stuck in fear, and fear is an attachment to a certain kind of thought. That's all it is. You see, to break free from all of this, we need to be able to see fearful thought operating. And I explain at length how to do that in my book. It, it, and give, us some, give us a good example of that, Mel, okay. from your book. Um, sometimes I'm working with a client and I will propose to them a new approach to something and they will say to me, that's hard to do. And I'll say to me, you just had a thought which told you that's hard to do. Now, how do you know it's hard to do? Has anyone ever suggested this? Have you ever tried this? And their answer is no. I said, so look at that. See how your old thought is defending its territory. It just told you it's hard to do. But you see, they didn't see it as a thought. They spoke to it as the truth. So I teach the reader how to identify and see old thought, which is tricking us. It's old thought that keeps us stuck and doesn't allow us to navigate new territory in our lives. But you can break free from that. What, what was the um trying to figure out how to say this when you had this epiphany of, of someone changing your 
uh, way of practicing with your your um, your clients. What was their reaction? At times, they might not even know it. Okay. In other words, typically, I don't sit with a client and discuss the uncertainty principle. Um, I don't talk about quantum physics. It's more subtle than that. Now, if they're interested, by all means, I'll go into it and, and help them apprehend it. But ordinarily, their experience of me is different. They, my, my clients will experience me as not being detached and making observations in clinical analyses. They will experience me in what I call a co-participatory process. We're participating together. Whatever they need to navigate to help them achieve their goals. It could be overcoming anxiety and depression. Um, I, I believe that I have very successfully helped people overcome anxiety and depression. I'm very proactive in my approach with my clients. And unlike many or most therapists, I will self-disclose. As I'm sharing stories with you today and your listeners, um, I do the same with my clients. Not to sit back and be buddies, but anything that I can share about my own life history that will help them achieve what they want, I share. Now, that's, that's rather non-traditional for a therapist. And I'm going to have to ask this. So what do your colleagues think about that? <laughs> um, sure. Um, you know, I, I don't participate in most professional organizations because I am renegade. I don't follow their path and I don't believe in how they think and teach. So to my surprise, six months ago, I got a phone call um, from the Connecticut marriage and family therapist wanting to know if I could address their annual conference. And I said, sure, I'd be interested. And they came up to my office and we had a long conversation. They were very intrigued about my approach and how I think. They had read many of my articles. And they actually wanted me to share this entire process. And I said, I'd love to. And I said, I have a couple of questions. How long will I be speaking for? They said, well, you'll be the only speaker. It's our annual conference, so you'll have a couple of hours. Oh, wow. And then I asked, how many therapists will be there? 300. I said, I'm in. <laughs> it, 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 it was so exciting for me to be able to share my approach and teach this to hundreds of therapists who are, who are actually hu hungry for it. It's something that they really wanted to learn. So, you know, given the time, I anticipate teaching therapists this approach as well. I do supervise therapists individually. And um, so I can't speak to how therapists in general think of my approach, um, but we'll find out. So, but, but I will add, Tommy, yeah. I'm not worried about what they think. Quite honestly. And I'm, I, I just have this understanding so far, Mel, that I, I think that your approach is one of those, you know, I, it's it's not Mel's way or the highway. It's more of how can I benefit my clients going forward by having the ability to not be afraid to try something different versus old school mentality. Yes, very much so. And so I find that if I think that I know who they are, and what's going on, and what my response should be, I'm not present. Certainly, I, and it requires a certain level of awareness. But I will work differently with every different person I work with. Um, I am not a therapist, and nor do I play one on TV, Mel. But the way I interpreted your experience in, in your book with The Sixth Sense, you talk about how animals can sense danger. And I'm trying, I was trying to, you know, kind of equate sensing danger 
in humans. And what I came up with, Mel, is, is it seems that animals are more present than humans. Well, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you an answer which you've read, but it will help your listeners. I was on vacation in uh, Cabo San Lucas many years ago. The desert meets the ocean. It was ideal. But that was during the week in which the tsunami devastated Indonesia. And I read a report in the Times that there was no reported death of wildlife. The animals had a sixth sense. They knew it was coming. I to my room to write an article. I have a blog. I've written over 100 articles. And this article was that humans used to have the sixth sense too. But with the age of rational intellectual analyzing, 19th century, we kind of separated our mind from our intuitive being. As I'm writing this article, a bird flies in the window of my room and literally perches itself on the armrest of my chair. It was a ma magical moment. My readings and understanding of what Carl Jung called synchronicity is when the conscious world, the mental world, in this case, my, the article I'm writing, hides with the material world. The material world, the universe, presents the bird. So I send off an email to a colleague who had just written a book on synchronicity, and I share the story. I wanted his opinion. He writes back to me and says, that's an incredible story, Mel, but it goes further. He said, let me tell you what I was doing when I opened your email. He was reading a book called How Animals Can Predict Earthquakes by the British biologist Rupert Sheldrake. So we got in touch with Sheldrake, and we spoke together at Yale on the commonality of our approaches. So I've learned and I teach whereby when we learn to see through wholeness, this new emerging worldview of inseparability, analyzing and slicing and dicing, we open up to these remarkable experiences, which previously may have been astounding, commonplace. Now, I'm not a psychic, but very often I can simply tune in and know. And that happens when we shift how we think reality operates. If we see through the filter of separation and we're analyzing and, and attaching to fearful thought, we're getting a very small slice of life. It all changes when you participate in a new sense of reality. And that's what the philosophy of this new science taught me. It is, as the mystics said, it's one universe. It's one world. It is oneness. What did you learn from writing this book? What personally did you learn from writing this book? I learned that writing a book of this complexity is really hard and challenging. Um, I, I learned that one of the challenges, I don't consider myself an intellectual. I consider myself like an intellectual dilettante. I'm not a serious intellectual. I get inspired by, I can read a great philosopher. What I learned in writing this book was that I needed to be able to articulate this and express this on a level which was easily accessible to many people because it's not an academic journal. So I, I believe I learned how to do it. And I did it by sharing lots of narratives and stories about my clients. I, I made it personal and I made it easy. Like you, you talked about the story about Groundhog's Day. Mm -hmm. Examples like that, that I had to bring something that was really lofty and bring it down and make it easy and accessible. Otherwise, you know, I'd be spinning my own wheels and it wouldn't be helpful to large numbers of people. So I learned that I needed to sometimes retreat from the realm of the lofty and the intellectual and bring it down to earth and make it available. What one principle would you want listeners to take away from 
and I know it's like trying to choose who your favorite son is, but what one principle from your book would you tell the listeners that not necessarily live your life by, but maybe think a little differently next time? I might speak to a quote from my book. The most important relationship that you will ever have, friends, your children, your spouse, your lovers, the relationship that will impact your life far more than any other relationship is with your thoughts. They are your constant companion. You need to learn to turn them into your ally. They script your life. If you want to become the author of your life experience, you, learn, you, you can learn the art of thinking. Now, if your listener says, that's interesting and great, how do I do that? Which sounds a little self-promotional to say by my book, but at the core, that is what the book is about. And if you don't buy my book, search for it somewhere else. There's a difference between thought and thinking. Thought is old. We have billions of the same thoughts throughout our life, and that's why we struggle with change. Thinking is my ability to step back and see my thought operating. Then there's a me than being imprisoned by the replication of all those old thoughts. I can see my thought. That's an entirely different life. That leads to wisdom. Did you have any internal conflicts that caused any um, issues because you went through a divorce? No. Um, in, in fact, I think going through a divorce may have helped me. My role as a marriage counselor is not necessarily to enjoin or force two people to remain married. My goal is... My bias is to help them be married, but to help them be happily, successfully, joyfully married. And the problem there is we were never taught how to do this. You know, in school, if we were taught emotional intelligence and relationships and communication alongside of history and English, it would be a different world. These are vitally important things, but we just stumbled through life thinking we're going to know how to do it. I actually do a lot of premarital counseling for that reason. So for me, uh, having gone through a divorce was, was a non-issue. In fact, it enlightened me. I was able to ask myself, who was I at the age of 30? I felt that I was in love with my former wife and wanted to marry her. Who was I? She hadn't changed over the years. When I got divorced, I realized I couldn't be angry with her. She was the same woman I met and fell in love with. I had to ask myself, who was I? Why did I think I was in love with her? And how had I changed? That was enlightening for me. And I, I bring that knowledge and that experience into my work. But just as, as an aside for a moment in regard to therapy, um, many people still have an attitude of there's nothing wrong with me. I don't need therapy. Um, I don't have a single close friend who hasn't been in therapy, and I have been in therapy any number of times in my life. You know, if I go to the gym and want to hire a trainer to help work me out, I wouldn't be embarrassed by that. So my entire approach and belief about therapy is if you can afford it, why wouldn't you want some assistance? Well, it's funny you say that. I was speaking to a gentleman who is getting married for the third time. And I told him my story, and that was when um, my wife and I were getting to that point where we were going to get married. She said, would you be interested in going to marriage counseling? Because we didn't want to make the same mistakes we did in our first marriage. And I said, I have no problem with that. I, had, you know, I, as I told you earlier, I'm, I'm an open book. And I think that's really strengthened our marriage was to go to counseling. And my, my thought process is when I explain that to other, especially men, is that they roll their eyes at me because it's like, oh, like you said, I don't need marriage counseling. I don't need counseling. I'm good. I'm fine. 
no, not all, we're not all fine. It's okay. And I still you think know, there's that stigma. Well, I, I, I think that the kind of person or the kind of man that says that, I'll, I'll just speak to that for a moment. It's about vulnerability. As men, we are taught to act strong and don't be vulnerable. Acting strong, if you're acting strong, that's weak. Comfortable with your vulnerability, which means openly what your self-doubts are or your insecurities are, paradoxically, that's strong. Somebody who's comfortable with their vulnerability actually has authentic self-esteem. The individual who says, I'm good, there's nothing to look at, is hiding. They're afraid. That's not introspective, collective. So as a culture, particularly for men, we are taught some false messages about self-esteem. And most of what compromise, comprises self-esteem, I call other esteem. You see, we're taught to derive what we call self-esteem by approval, recognition, success. But all those things come from outside of me. I call that other esteem. And many people betray their authentic self to derive recognition, approval, that's a betrayal of yourself. It's great to be approved of, but not for the purpose of betraying your own genuine self to try to manipulate others to like you. It's paradoxical. That decreases your authentic self-esteem. And it's a core message and value that's just absolutely in reverse in our culture. What would you say to the men out there, Mel? Or, you know what, let me turn around. What would you say to the women on how they can help men be more comfortable going to seeking help? I, I would say that the first thing a woman might do, and of course I wouldn't leave this simply um, with the gender difference, because sometimes it's the man who could say the woman, is to say, you're open and vulnerable, maybe even sad or insecure, and you don't hide that from me, I find that loving. I find that lovable. Wouldn't you like me to find you lovable? When you defend yourself, there's nothing to love. And so you take that message and then you pivot with, and I understand that therapy might be able to help you become more comfortable being that way. And that would allow me to be more loving of you. Wouldn't that be a good thing? Your readers, what can your readers essentially get out of your book that's going to impact their lives today? That would depend upon what they're looking for. Now, so my book addresses the following, how to achieve authentic self-esteem how to become the master of your thinking, how to engage what I consider conscious communication or breakthrough communication, where we get past that right or wrong battle that so many of us get stuck in, how we, how we can learn to escape the pain and the wounds and the limitations of our past to create a future whereby we are really writing the script of our life how there's a chapter in my book called from being to becoming whereby i'm no longer stuck as a human being but i'm in the process of becoming i wrote an article many years ago called who am i and to my surprise i found that hundreds of thousands of people read it the article simply put says who am i is the wrong question because that proposes as a fixed answer we should be asking ourselves how would i like to experience my life so I think that different readers will take away different things based upon what they're looking for. It could be relationship skills. It could be overcoming anxiety and depression. It, it can be finding meaning and purpose in your life, overcoming fear. There's a wide range of takeaways, and each reader is looking for something different. There's, there's an overlay, but I couldn't speak to one takeaway from the book other than the title. The possibility principle, 
The book is designed to help you reclaim your lost potential and helps you unleash your possibilities, as I've shared in my own anecdotes about my own life. Well, Mel Schwartz, again, the author of The Possibility Principle, The Possibility Principle, Mr. Mel Schwartz, thank you so much for your time today. I enjoyed reading your book, and uh, I think I've, I've got some things I need to work on as well after reading your book. <laughs> Tommy, it was great talking to you. You asked wonderful questions, and it's a pleasure getting to know you. Thank you for listening to Blending the Family. That was an interesting, fun fact during the show.